So while I was on this road trip headed north, we got into New England and everything started to look like this. There was fishing towns, there was loads of clam chowder everywhere, there were cliffs and boats and lighthouses. Boys, this village is so cool. But wait, this isn't a family vlog that we're doing here. You saw the title. We're talking about a border dispute. So yeah, while I'm on this trip, I do what I always do. I look at the map of where we're going and I sort of start to explore. And being the person that I am, my attention always drifts away from the actual road trip route and starts focusing on this weird line up here. These are the lines we use to draw countries. We call them borders. And man, the number of hours I have spent tracing these lines on a map, just looking at them, following them, looking for, well, nothing, just looking. Seeing what shape this important imaginary line takes. Most of the time, it's pretty predictable. A river or a straight line determined by some treaty. But as I traced this US-Canada border, the border that frames the state of Maine, I eventually started to get into the ocean, where this border line on Google Maps runs into a hard stop right here off the coast of Maine. When I see something like this, my curiosity wheels just start spinning and I can't not look into it. And it turns out that this line that looks like the end of something is actually just the beginning. Two lines, two different claims. This is the story of a little rocky island with a solitary lighthouse. It's the story of Canadian and American fishermen looking for lobsters and competing with each other. It's the story of puffins and tourists and Donald Trump's foreign policy. This is the story of the one territorial border dispute between the US and Canada. This area has never been properly surveyed as, as far as who owns what. We don't want to do this. We have no choice. This is the longest border in the world, and it's not really full of much drama. If you rewind a bit, you'll see that this whole area was claimed by the British Empire. There was no Canada, there was no United States, but eventually the British settlers down here decided to rebel from the empire and start their own country. The British conceded all of this land to the new United States of America. Fast forward 100 years and you now have the country of Canada, and the border that we know today begins to take shape without too much conflict. But over here in the ocean, there were some problems. The treaty that the British had signed with the newly independent Americans had said that the United States could claim any territory that was south of this river and that was within 20 leagues of its coast. There was this one island over here called Machia Seal Island, which was well within the claim of the United States based on this treaty. But the British up here, which were soon to be Canadians, referenced an even earlier document that said that they owned any island that was within six leagues of their coast. So if you look at that island, you can see that there are some overlapping claims. Both of these documents gave this one island to both of these countries. These conflicting treaties caused all sorts of border issues in the ocean up in New England off the coast of Maine. But no one really cared because there was nothing valuable about this piece of ocean. Unless you fast forward 100 years to the 1970s. So it's the 1970s and the United States and Canada are realizing that this piece of ocean is actually pretty valuable because it has mineral deposits that they want to extract. So they take their dispute to the International Court of Justice, which is in charge of working out border disputes, especially in the ocean. They both submit their claims and over the next like five years, the International Court of Justice does potentially the most boring work in the world, looking at so many measurements and so many different charts and maps and treaties to determine where this border should be. And by the mid 1980s, they settle on a clean, nice border that looks like this. Until it got right here. This is the area surrounding Machia Seal Island, a tiny rocky island that both countries claim. There was no known minerals here. There was nothing valuable. All there was was this old lighthouse that the British had built in the 1800s and that the Canadians inherited. So the borders here continued to look like this. This is called the Gray Zone, and it is the one territorial border dispute between the United States and Canada. Wait, 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 pause. 
Look at this clip. I did not shoot this clip myself. Didn't go into the middle of the ocean to get this random clip. Instead, I downloaded it from Storyblocks, who is the sponsor of this video, and who I'm going to tell you about for a minute before we continue on our journey about this weird border dispute. Storyblocks is a place where I get loads of footage. Lots of the footage you've seen in this video came from Storyblocks, because even though I was traveling up in New England, I was not deep in the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> with my drone. But luckily, thanks to Storyblocks, I was able to go on and find lots of really solid footage that helps make stories a lot more visually rich. I've used Storyblocks for like five or six years, long before they ever came to sponsor me. I've used it for a lot of other projects, for borders and lots of other things. And I can't say enough good things about it. It is a giant repository of hundreds of thousands of assets, not just footage, but also After Effects templates, sound effects. It's just a huge amount of stuff that you can use to create beautiful video. The other thing I love about it is that it's a subscription. So you pay one monthly subscription and you get unlimited downloads of this high quality footage. So you can like download like as many clips as you want and you pay the same price, which is really nice. If you are a creator of any sort, even if you don't do this professionally and you wanna practice and learn, Storyblocks is a great way to get your hands on high quality footage to use in your projects. Go to storyblocks.com slash Johnny Harris. It's a link in my description. When you click that link, it supports this channel, but it also helps you learn more about how to get in on all of this amazing footage and different assets. Thank you Storyblocks for sponsoring this video. And now back to the story. Okay, so you have this sort of bizarre border dispute between the US and Canada, but there aren't any natural resources for anyone to actually care about this. But that quickly starts to change. As I drove north into New England, I became familiar with a natural resource that is actually very valuable and that would turn this rocky lighthouse island into an actual conflict. And that resource looks like this. This is lobster meat. It comes from a lobster that lives at the bottom of the ocean and the people catch her out here and bring to my roll. Lobstering is a big deal in Maine, like a $500 million big deal. It is the number one export of this state and Maine takes in more lobster than any other state in the United States. And not surprisingly, it is a big deal in Canada, who also has a giant lobster industry. This gray zone, the disputed territory in the ocean, straddles the fishing zones between the two countries. So right now, this is really the crux of the conflict. You have a growing lobster industry on both sides with independent lobstermen trying to maximize their catch and going into the gray zone. The problem is that Canada and the United States have different rules and regulations around when you can fish, how much you can fish, but when they get into the gray zone, a lot of that sort of goes out the window and it leads to some major conflict, some deep resentment between the lobstermen and overfishing of this delicate ecosystem. We've had people shot over lobster fishing conflicts, you know, and significant violence over lobster fishing conflicts. So I guess the big question is who actually owns this water? Like who has the more legit claim? At the heart of the Canadian claim is this lighthouse. This lighthouse was built by the British in the 1800s, but the Canadians inherited it and they've occupied it ever since. When you're disputing over who owns what land, having physical infrastructure on that land is a pretty decent claim. And even though lighthouses have become totally automated, meaning they don't need people to run them, the Canadian military has insisted on keeping a person there 24 seven. They will helicopter out someone and their family to man this lighthouse at all times to make sure that there are people there. Not because anyone needs to be there to run the lighthouse, but solely because they wanna beef up their claim that this island and the surrounding water is theirs. If you wanna see a glimpse into the day of a life of the person who unnecessarily mans this random lighthouse on a tiny island, there's a really beautifully shot short film by a channel called Jungles in Paris, which gives you an idea of what this life is like. Instead of being the keeper of the light out here, you're more of the keeper of the island. Meanwhile, the US basically says all of this is bogus. 
that the island is rightfully theirs, the fishery around the island is rightfully theirs, it has been since 1782, and they do not recognize any sovereignty of Canada on this island. The local fishermen and population in Maine also are very vehemently attached to the U.S. claim of this island. There was this guy, uh, his name is Barnabas what? Barton Barnabas. Barna Norton. Barna Norton. Barna. Barna. Barna Norton, who would show up every year on the island with an American flag to plant it to assert the sovereignty of the United States. So again, in front of this sign, I declare this island belongs to the United States. And just remember, for the people in Maine, this is not about geopolitics. This is about their livelihood, the future of their livelihood, of their number one export, a huge part of their lifestyle and their economy. And it's the locals who are the most active in this fight. The US government, from a federal or state department level, kind of doesn't really care most of the time. And meanwhile, while all of this lobster drama is happening, you have boats from both countries bringing tourists onto the islands to look at puffins. So let's just get up to speed, see where we're at. We're talking about these vaguely worded treaties that led to a territorial dispute that no one really cared about until they did because of lobsters. And then Canada put a person in this lighthouse even though this lighthouse didn't need a person. And then there's puffins. Can you see now why I'm like way into the story? Okay, so now let's talk about Donald J. Trump. Ugh, I know. Okay. It turns out that this obscure, small-scale border dispute is like clickbait for Donald Trump. I mean, think about it. This is a valuable American industry that is being threatened by outsiders coming in and stealing our goods. It's just like, just perfect for him. This is an opportunity to show American power. The Canadian government is investigating reports Canadian boats have been approached and questioned by U.S. Border Patrol agents at the Gulf of Maine. The U.S. officials claim they were looking for illegal immigrants, and the border officials have stopped at least 10 fishing boats in the past two weeks. So in 2018, the Trump administration sends out Border Patrol into the gray zone to stop Canadian lobstermen and interrogate them. They stop 10 different crews and ask them about drugs and immigration. <laughs> it's just like, come on, dude. It was such a Trump thing to do. It wasn't like, let's have some overtures for some diplomatic conversations about how we can actually resolve this border dispute peacefully. It was like, send in the border patrol and intimidate them and show them how strong we are. What's going on over here? Hey, look at this! So fast forward to today, it's 2020, and we're in an election year. And when I say that the US government doesn't care about this border dispute, the caveat to that is during an election year, suddenly they care. Because the people of Maine care, and the people of Maine who care also vote. And you get the picture here. The senator from Maine, Susan Collins, wrote a letter to the Trump administration. And she was like, thanks so much for sending your like badass border patrol out to intimidate the Canadians. It didn't really do anything. Can we actually find a useful, enduring solution to this conflict through, you know, diplomacy? She mentioned that the gray zone is home to this valuable part of the livelihood of people in Maine and ask the administration to actually do something. Meanwhile, Trump has shown a strange interest in this issue. He actually went to Maine and hosted this round table with a bunch of people from the fishing industry, and he brought up the gray zone. How did you let that, how did they let that happen? Obama just used That was pen. President Obama, thank President you very Obama. much, with a pen. <laughs> So this meeting ended up being Trump going up to basically rally these people and be pissed off with them about how they're being screwed out of their lobster. I mean, you gotta be kidding. Is that right? That's correct, sir. That's so right. they just closed it. They said you can't fish. But let me guess, other countries do, right? No, uh, they do. And then of course he followed his standard script and basically mentioned how great he is. You're so lucky I'm president. <laughs> you are so lucky. I don't even know you and you're so lucky. So the upshot here is that Canada cares a lot more about this sovereignty claim than the United States. Unless it's an election year, in which case US politicians will do some little things to curry favor among lobstermen. The US 
doesn't really care that much about this, not nearly as much as Canada does, who actually uses their like military resources to man this island. This dispute and the status quo is likely to stay sort of as it is, unless of course they discover a legitimately valuable resource like oil or some other very valuable thing. If that were to happen, I think the US from like a foreign policy standpoint would step up to the plate and actually wage this war. So for now, the lighthouse will continue to be unnecessarily manned by a Canadian. The lobstermen will keep fighting and overfishing in the gray zone and boats from both countries will continue to cart out loads of tourists to take pictures of puffins. Thank you Storyblocks for sponsoring. Thank you all for watching. I've got more videos coming up. A lot of videos this month. Wow, man, lots of videos. Lastly, I just wanna say thank you to those who support me on Patreon. It's like such a wonderful community of people who are giving their money to support these videos and I'm very grateful to them. So more to come on Patreon. I'll be posting loads of stuff soon and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.